Hi, my name is Emmy Peck. Welcome to the show. It is not often that museums display exhibits of living artists. The Detroit Institute of Arts astonishingly is presenting the work of two very much living artists who live and work together, married artist Isabel and Ruben Toledo. The Toledos, who were political refugees from Cuba as free teenagers, now live and work mainly in New York City. Working together does not mean that they practice the same type of art. Ruben draws paints makes three-dimensional art pieces such as the mannequins you will see in the exhibit while Isabel creates dresses and gowns and everything possible to make from fabrics and many other materials shoes handbags and anything one can imagine from two-dimensional to three-dimensional objects
why they can work on individual projects. Most likely, their work turns into cooperation, exchanging ideas automatically, producing items that are a fusion of two unique talents. Labor of Love features their love of the DIA's famous art objects, reimagined by Ruben and Isabel in their unique, thoughtful, but witty way. Ruben's love and admiration of Diego Rivera's world-famous mural, Detroit Industry, has a strong influence on the exhibit. while Isabel's magnificent ball gowns and what she calls her interventions and her interventions allows new interpretations of several DIE art objects or even galleries for us to ponder. Um, there 
was so kind and generous. First of all, we got a first class art education beyond ever, uh, that anyone has ever had because it's first hand experience, whether it's Egyptian or Renaissance or early American. And um, yes, we ended up doing nine interventions, but it could have been 90. We had to edit down. We were yeah. usually uh, too ambitious, so we had to whittle it down because it's fascinating history. And for us, it's all about collaboration and cross pollination. I have to say that I'm listening to you, Salvador, say that so many different nationalities came together to support this exhibit. I felt my job is done. It was about weaving together the cultures that are held in this uh, museum, all the art from all these different cultures. I, it was important to me as a fashion designer, as a humanist, because that's what I do. I work with the body, I work with the body language, I know it well, and I wanted to weave it together to bring you into our house. So I, I thank you for letting me know that, that so many great people got involved in supporting it. So thank you. My name is Paul Butcher. I'm a docent here at the DIA. Docent is just a fancy name for tour guide, uh, but I'm your tour guide for today. Uh, I first heard of Isabel and Ruben Toledo uh, when Isabel designed Michelle Obama's inauguration dress that she wore when President Obama was sworn in the first time. Uh, here is a husband and wife team who collaborate and work together. Uh, a fascinating story. Uh, they fell in love with the DIA's collection, but also with the Detroit Industry Murals uh, of Diego Rivera. Uh, conversations began at that time to create a special exhibition. Uh, they came back a few months later, uh, and those conversations furthered, saying we really would like to do something that involves the Detroit Industry Murals, and here we are today, about a year and a half later. I remember one Friday night, months after that initial presentation with uh, Leon, uh, Andre Leon Talley. Uh, I was here and all of a sudden the curator was walking the Toledos through the museum and I happened to be working that night uh, in the Italian Renaissance section. Uh, she stopped and asked if I would tell them a little bit about a dress and a painting. Uh, it's a painting about Eleonora de Toledo. It was painted in 1545. I said, this woman has the same last name as you. Uh, and don't you wish you had designed that dress? Luckily, they laughed. Uh, it is a stunning dress. Uh, what's interesting about the Toledos, both Ruben and Isabel immigrated as children from Cuba uh, at about age five or six. Uh, they didn't meet until high school in a Spanish class. Uh, he fell hard from the first. She says she didn't. It took her a while to be convinced. Um, but they knew that art was what they wanted to do. They knew that art was their passion. Uh, they have been influenced, worked with, guided by uh, some of the biggest names uh, in, especially in the late, er, late 70s, early 80s, uh, in the avant-garde art movement, Andy Warhol, uh, others. It's just, just an amazing list, but I don't think it really affected them. When you meet them, you'll see that they're just regular people. They don't even have cell phones. Uh, uh, just an amazing way that they work together, complete each other's sentences, and that's what you're going to see today. You're going to see uh, the art that they've collected. Uh, she is a fashion designer, couture, doesn't do ready to wear. Um, she designs at the sewing machine. She feels the fabric and designs there. She doesn't really do a drawing beforehand. Afterwards, he then completes the drawings. They, they work together. Uh, just an amazing collaboration. I think you're going to enjoy that. You're going to see uh, the synergies that they created together, working together. You're going to see how they took art from the past and connected it to the future and the present. Um, you're also going to see ways that they've tried to engage you and I uh, to see art uh, and fashion in a whole new sense. They, they use fashion and art, and we're going to see new and different ways to do that. So I hope you enjoy it today. The piece you're looking at right now is a photograph of dresses that Isabel designed for Anne Klein. They're called broomstick dresses. Uh, what's interesting is she sews these beautiful dresses uh, and then he hand colors them. Again, that collaboration of them working together. Uh, what's great about this is you can almost see these dresses dancing, can't you? And we're going to see them used again as we move on into the exhibition. So welcome to the first room in the special exhibition called Labor of Love. What you're looking at is Ruben Toledo's interpretation of the original drawings that Diego Rivera did in the Detroit murals at the top of the wall. Uh, he drew four very androgynous race that showed what the 
four elements from the earth that make metal. Cars were made of metal in 1932. Uh, so the yellow race represents sandstone, limestone, coal, and iron ore. What Ruben Toledo has done, though, is taken a new interpretation of that. First of all, he's moved them from being androgynous to very feminized. He's also then used uh, a special way to camouflage their nakedness. Uh, so again, using kind of fashion and art, to combining that. What you're going to see, though, is he was inspired uh, by a technique that was developed in World War I uh, on special battleships. Uh, they didn't really use camouflage at that time, but they used a thing called dazzle ships. Uh, they painted them almost to look like zebras, so that way you couldn't tell what direction the ship was going in the water. He used that same type of thing here with these uh, four now beautiful women representing the basic elements. What you're going to see, he's also then drawn into the past. You're going to see, uh, while he's feminized them, he also has used some of the same gestures of the heads and the hands. Rivera did in Rivera Court. For instance, on the yellow race woman, you're going to see sand dripping through her hands, just like you do in Rivera Court. But also you're going to see this, this whole thing is called color code. And what you're going to see on the side of each of the panels uh, is a, the colors that he used to actually paint these. Uh, but he also is showing you that when he mixes colors together, they blend to make a different color. Um, what's also interesting is the technique he used. Uh, these are painted on pleated material. So this is a long piece of linen that he then had professional pleaters actually pleat. He puts it down on the ground, uh, uses a stencil to get the initial shape, and then he paints this. So what looks like for you and I as we walk through here in a few minutes, vertical blinds like on a patio window, it's actually pleated material that could unfold to be twice as long. Uh, uh, but just beautiful pieces. Uh, but when we get to the end, we're going to stop and I have you turn back and you won't be able to see these four women. The same thing with the, uh, the Dazzle ships from World War I. Uh, they disappear, which is a remarkable piece. Now as you're looking back uh, from the entrance that we just came in, you'll see that the, uh, the same technique that uh, Alexander Calder used on these uh, battleships during World War I, uh, Ruben Toledo used here, and these women have now disappeared. So now we have a very unique opportunity to look at five of Diego Rivera's original drawings for the Detroit Industry Murals. Uh, this is what the Toledos wanted to do, is show past and present of art. Uh, the woman that you're looking at right now is the model for how Michigan began. Uh, this woman's holding fruit. Uh, we're going to see in a few minutes a woman holding vegetables. These are very delicate. Uh, they are done on almost butcher paper with charcoal and uh, chalk. Uh, we roll them up and store them. Uh, there's a little piece of paper that goes over them when they're rolled up. So every time we unroll them, uh, a little more of the pigments of the chalk uh, and the charcoal go away. Uh, these will be out through the exhibition through uh, early July. And then they're going to go away for 30 years. So for me, this is my last chance to see them. So every day I come in uh, and, and almost treat this like a church and get to see these original drawings. What you're going to see when you look at these different than when you look at Rivera Court uh, is the compassion that he shows in these. You're going to see uh, a, a more compassion, I believe, in their eyes, in their lips uh, than you see in Rivera Court. This is the second woman, again, showing nurturing and nature. This is the woman that then became the model on Rivera Court uh, for the woman of Native American descent. But again, for me, when you look at her eyes uh, and her lips, uh, just a whole different compassion than you see when he's painting fast and furious into the wet plaster. So what we're looking at now is the drawing that Diego Rivera did for the Eastern Wall in the Detroit Mural Galleries. There, uh, the original to show Michigan was an agricultural society was to be a man on a tractor, is the drawings that, that we had been shown. 
Uh, his wife, Frida Kahlo, who was hurt in a bad tram accident as a teenager in Mexico, uh, was wearing a brace, a bad leg. Uh, she conceived while uh, they were here, in the 11 months they were here. But on July 4th of 1932, she lost the pregnancy at Henry Ford Hospital up on Grand Boulevard. He started painting the walls uh, in Rivera Court on July 25th. So between July 4th and July 25th, he changed this from a man on a tractor in a farm scene to a baby in a seed pot. It represents all of us. It uh, represents how much nature takes care of us, feeds us, and protects us. It also represents their loss. Isabel Toledo then used this drawing as part of her inspiration for the next thing we're going to look at, which is a beautiful set of mannequins in beautiful dresses called Migration. So what we're looking at now is a collaboration that both Ruben and Isabel did together called Migration. Uh, she took inspiration from the infant in the seed pod that we looked at earlier uh, and created this about migration. Uh, she shows how uh, the United States especially is a, a, a very cross-cultural uh, and how if you'll notice on each of these, uh, the women uh, in the background behind this first lead woman are all wearing headdresses that look like flowers. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But let's look at this first dress. What you'll see there is, um, and all of these are very elaborate dresses uh, in multiple layers. Uh, you're going to see that, and those are in somewhat uh, reflective of the way Frida Kahlo dressed and especially her petticoats. Uh, what you're going to see on this first one though is a unique use of color. Uh, the gold and silver are very much the same kind of tonal impact that we saw on these uh, original chalk drawings by Diego Rivera. What you're going to see is the material is material that she designed over the last 30 years for her couture shows. Uh, this is from her private archives. Uh, she designs it, then has uh, uh, fabric makers make her material. Uh, beautiful. You're going to notice on each one of the dresses that we look at today, uh, something flower on each, on some piece of the material. But this first one, you're going to see the woman without the seed pot, the, the flower pod on her head. Uh, this one to me is more dressed uh, uh, almost like a Madonna. And what's interesting is uh, the artist very definitely wanted this woman and her womb to be at the same level as the baby in the seed pod, and she faces that. So now we're looking at the individual dresses and mannequins that make up the migration installation. Again, pay attention to the floral heads that the women are wearing. Uh, they're beautiful mannequins. What's interesting is Ruben designs all of these mannequins. Uh, look at the dresses and the material. The ones that we're looking at, you can see just stunning material. There's one that looks like peacock material. There's one that uh, almost looks like it's out of Star Wars, right? With a, um, a multicolored blue and silver flower, and then this beautiful uh, beaded sequined material. But notice again, they all have a bit of a floral arrangement in them. They're all layers and levels. Um, the one directly in front of us, uh, is one of my favorites. What's interesting there is this beautiful uh, tapestry material, uh, but then uh, the beautiful use of fringe both in the front and in the back uh, is pretty stunning. The dress behind it in white, uh, while you think that's fairly simple, take a good look at that. Look at the layers. There's a, uh, a petticoat, a, a skirt, uh, a jacket, a blouse, uh, fairly elaborate. Uh, the material, again, uh, showing lace, and we're going to look at lace later on and how strong that makes women. Uh, it's a very strong weave. Uh, to the far end, you'll see two more women, uh, and then we're going to look at one dress close up.
the piece we're looking at now is, is remarkable. Again, you can see the collaboration. Ruben did the talisman in the front. Uh, this dress, though, uh, has, I think, to me, special meanings. When you look down uh, midway where the, the rust color material ends, you're going to see um, uh, little almost bubbles of, of lace material that have what look like uh, rolls of quarters almost in them. Uh, what Isabel has said is that for migration, this, this really is also a representation of uh, uh, almost an ammunition belt uh, and the strength that women give as people are migrating. But this whole thing about that you, as you look through here and see the flower pods, this whole idea is that um, we cross pollinate uh, as people migrate into the United States, uh, they cross pollinate, they become one. Uh, they still keep part of their roots, but then they become a new nation. You're looking now at a special piece that again ties the past, the present, and the future together. It also combines two industries. Uh, you'll see in the background on a piece of Belgian linen, uh, we sent the Toledos a high resolution negative of Rivera Court. They had that put on this piece of linen. Then uh, you remember those broomstick dresses that we saw when we first entered the gallery. Uh, they then took those broomstick dresses and printed, again, images of Rivera Court on those. Uh, then you're going to see that they then pinned them on to the canvas, uh, and you get kind of a choreography of labor. What Isabel says is that this is a showing that um, the men in a Rivera's original Rivera Court, they're leaning, they're working together, the same thing in her studio. As she's getting ready to do a collection, uh, she has pressers, she has steamers, she has tailors uh, working together uh, to get a collection out the door. So she shows the parallels between two different industries, but I love this, the whole idea of the choreography of labor. Uh, those men in the original Rivera drawings, you see them almost like they're dancing, and here you see these dresses doing that same kind of lyrical, beautiful dance. What's interesting is this, the way she shipped this to us. Uh, the dresses are attached to the canvas. It's rolled up and put into a, uh, a pipe kind of uh, container. Then it took us two days to unroll that and stretch it out onto the canvas. Uh, our curators did, I think, a beautiful job with that. What's interesting, once it got on the wall, uh, Isabel came and at the very end, you'll see on both sides, she, uh, gently shredded the end so it would look not quite finished. So what we're looking at now is uh, throughout the installations, everything is bilingual, both in Spanish and in English. Uh, this is a quote from Isabel. It was hand painted the night before the exhibit opened uh, freehand on the wall by Ruben. Uh, but it talks about how fashion and art uh, and I'll let you read it on your own, uh, but a great way of how she sees fashion and the importance of that and the whole reinvention of an, the normal way we do things. So what you're looking at now is Isabel's first sewing machine. Uh, as I said earlier, she doesn't do a, a, a sketch before she designs something. She sets down with the material in her hand and designs at, at the machine. She calls this machine Mother. Uh, it's where all of her inspiration and her designs come from. Uh, what you'll see though is she has wrapped this in black satin taffeta, uh, but you'll, she's, you'll see she also added things. Underneath the machine, you'll see she added an, a pair of udders. Uh, she says this is like a cow. Uh, it just keeps uh, not only giving milk, but in her idea, giving her inspiration, so it's just continuing to do that. Well, you also, if you read her autobiography, you'll, you'll hear that she, um, she remembers as a young girl in Cuba, before she immigrated to the United States, she would play underneath her grandmother's sewing machine. She didn't learn to sew until she came to the United States. Uh, but this was her first machine. You'll also see as you go up on the machine, uh, she's added high heels to either end of the machine. And you're going to see these beautiful pieces of uh, of string, of, of threads. Uh, she says this represents uh, 
kind of the, the way that the fashion industry has changed. Uh, so, the, so there's a sorrow in this. Uh, it's called Black Cloud, the installation. But to me, it also gives a sense of inspiration. As you, as you pan up, we're going to see beautiful dresses that are coming from the threads, coming from the sewing machine. So this is the, the reflecting the dresses that she's created. Uh, it also, I think, shows the inspiration. Uh, just for me, I've said I've never thought of a dress as a chandelier before. And now the next time I redo our house, I may have to do a dress as a chandelier. One thing you're going to notice behind us is a blue wall. Uh, they hand painted this blue wall. Uh, it's in honor of Casa Azul, Frida Kahlo's house in Mexico City, where she was born, where she and Diego lived, where she eventually, unfortunately, died. Um, what's interesting for us, uh, we had to call in expert wallpaper hangers to then install this beautiful uh, hand-painted wall. So what we're looking at now is actually a collaboration between Diego Rivera and uh, Ruben Toledo. So these first two pieces are from uh, the original drawings that Diego Rivera did for Rivera Court. Uh, on the far right, you're going to see the making of gas bombs. Uh, in the center here, you're going to see um, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and then as we pan, you're going to see Ruben's take uh, on kind of the whole idea of tying these three panels together on uh, deconstructing industry. Again, you're going to see behind that, that blue wall representing Casa Azul. Uh, you're also going to see uh, a very elaborate where uh, Isabel also helped with this mural that uh, Ruben did. You're going to see beautiful embroidery, uh, almost quilting. Uh, you're going to see uh, mannequins uh, being dismantled. Uh, but you'll see how then the past and the present combine. this case is on one side you're going to see 12 political cartoons, uh, satire cartoons uh, from Diego Rivera in the 40s and 50s. And on the right hand side you're going to see that same type of political satire cartoons from Ruben Toledo from the early 2000s. What's interesting to me, we'll see in just a few minutes, is how on top of things these guys were. So right now you're looking at two of the 12 political satire type of cartoons uh, drawn by Ruben Toledo uh, from 2005 and 2006. Uh, the first one we're looking at is called Saving the Endangered Species, Support Homegrown Organic Talent from the Ground Up. Just again, speaks for itself, beautiful color, fashion, art combined. The one on the right is again, uh, copyright, beware, beware of the fashion police. So uh, here's a woman who's trying to uh, make her own fashion and all of a sudden uh, the big fashion police are coming after her because she's violated copyrights. But again, the whole idea of fashion and art having us look at things differently. So Ruben does political satire cartoons for Detail Magazine, uh, Paper Magazine, Vogue, The New York Times. This particular cartoon that we're looking at is called uh, Ammunition Implants, The New Look of Homeland Security. It was drawn in 2006, long before the whole idea of what's going on on the borders today. But look at this, how he again shows ammunition, uh, guns, fashion, morphing people into fashionistas.
So now you're looking at two of the 12 political cartoons that Diego Rivera did between 1944 and 1957. The one on the right is showing the underdogs of Mexico City. So again, you'll see very similar to some of the things we saw in Rivera Court. The two women in the foreground are sitting on cross legs, pleated hair. Uh, but you, again, you remember Diego Rivera got his start uh, in Mexico after the Mexican Revolution. Uh, he saw himself as a communist, a socialist, uh, proud of workers. On the far left, though, is the upper dogs of Mexico City. Uh, what's interesting there is you'll see that while people are going hungry, out of work, uh, there's that upper 1% that uh, are eating high on the hog. Uh, Rivera and Frida Kahlo believe they saw some of those same type of things in Detroit when they were here in 1932 and 33 uh, during the Great Depression. There are three things that happen as you leave uh, this exhibition called Labor of Love. The first is you get to sign what I call the guest book. Uh, the Toledo's put together a book where you're encouraged to share your thoughts and even your drawings. What's interesting is Ruben has done 50 drawings that he shares with you and then encourages you then to share your drawings with them. Also, as you leave the galleries, what you would see then is a community collaboration that the uh, Toledo's did. They worked with a group of women uh, who are learning to sew. They're paid uh, to come to work and sew. Uh, in our gift shop, they've been sewing um, tote bags for the last couple of years for us to sell. Uh, the Toledo's met with them, worked with them. The ladies came here to the DA, many of them for the first time. Uh, had lunch, worked with the Toledo's, designed their own tote bag, sewed that for the Toledo's. Ruben then uh, hand painted those and those were sold with the proceeds going back to the community. So again, that labor of love. The last thing in any of our installations is a, a collaboration asking people what and who inspires you to create. And there's a great uh, things that people do. They say that my mom, my dad, I saw the other day a, a person actually folded a, an origami piece of paper and put it up on the wall to show what, what inspires them to create. So uh, Isabel and Ruben then did nine pop-up uh, installations called Interventions, where they're, again they're showing how we take art that existed in the DIA and how it inspired them to create new art. Uh, this is a piece that inspired uh, a dress that we're going to look at in a few minutes. Uh, this is a painting of a, an American turn of the Revolutionary War. Uh, but look at her dress, uh, especially the, uh, what we call the stomach air the, the, uh, of that dress, because it's going to become important when we look at how Isabel then interpreted this painting uh, by John Feck. So we're looking now at a beautiful dress that was inspired by a revolutionary, American Revolutionary War portrait. Uh, this is, what you'll notice is the stomach air of this, is the last remaining remnant of the material that was used in Michelle Obama's coat dress that she wore when Barack Obama was first sworn in. Uh, so I, we're lucky to have that, but then I love, again in this collaboration, uh, look at the skirt of the dress. You're going to see there uh, drawings then that Ruben then hand painted onto the material uh, of Michelle and Barack Obama as they make the walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. What I also love is the mannequin that he did. Uh, I love the way that it's here in uh, a colonial dining room and entertainment area. Uh, going back then to the uh, showing uh, the historical moment of the swearing in of Barack Obama. So here we are uh, in another American gallery of the American art. 
Uh, we're looking at a painting by Mary Hurst that was painted in about 1760 uh, of a young little girl. Uh, but what you're going to see in front of here, her are dolls that we call couture dolls. Uh, at this time in American history, uh, there wasn't uh, a Vogue magazine, there weren't big shows in Paris and Milan and New York City, uh, there wasn't Project Runway. Um, they, dress designers would make these little dolls with miniature ensembles, uh, hats, shoes, jewelry, all kinds of accessories, and then ship them out to potential buyers, and the buyers then would order from that. So what uh, Isabel did was take that idea of couture dolls uh, and then do an American set of dolls. What I love about these dolls uh, uh, is the detail. So all of these have shoes. Look at their hats. Look at the first one on the far left. Uh, you're going to see a tri-cornered uh, American kind of revolutionary hat. You're going to see a talisman around her neck, probably very Native American. But again, much like the dresses we saw in the major installation, um, look at the layers, look at the use of the material. I love the doll with the big cowboy hat and the veil. Uh, not too many times do you see a cowboy hat and a veil. Look at the, the dress and the skirt and the jacket. The jacket very buckskin-like with fringe. Look at the dress. I love that. I don't know whether it's bows. To me, it looks like a lot of candy, and I just love that. Look at the dress next to it in the hot pink. Uh, then look at the face. Look at the, uh, the almost necklace surrounding the face. Um, on the far right, again, a very kind of blend of Native American, uh, pioneer, uh, buckskin, turquoise, uh, just amazing. What also, I don't know if you can see as we pan down, is on top of the dresser that they're standing on are faces that Ruben then painted. Um, each of those faces then represent the whole idea of as America was becoming the country we know today, uh, of the multiple uh, cultures, races, migration uh, that make up uh, America. What well, you'll also notice as we go down on the bottom, uh, you'll see then the labels as you come into each of the galleries where it talks about what this particular uh, set of dresses represent, in this case, young Americans. You'll see then a symbol that then Ruben created so that you know what you're looking at when you're looking at maps. Uh, and then you'll also see uh, a reference back to the painting by Mary Hurst of what inspired the Toledos to make this installation. Then you'll also see it in Spanish. What's also interesting is after the buyers bought their dresses, then these dolls then were given to children so that uh, they're still, if you look at any kind of early American collection of dolls, you're always going to find couture dolls in that collection. Young girls then played with the hottest fashions of the world. We're looking at the fifth of the couture dolls in the American collection. What's beautiful about this doll is uh, there was no room at the other table for it, so she got a table of her own and it has then a beautiful mirror behind it. So this way you get to see the exquisite detail of what uh, Isabel Toledo did. Isabel was addressing the, 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 the very powerful Tsar sculpture. And, and I wanted to do it in different colors because I wanted to express different emotions as opposed to just one emotion. Fashion has this incredible way of, of covering up our nakedness, right? Or almost, uh, uh, for society's sake, covering up your emotions so that you sort of fit in. But Isabel was referencing the fact that even when you're, when you're fully dressed and fully elegant, your, your, your human emotions do erupt, and that's the beauty of it. There's things you just can't control. And Shape of Faith, Shape which is of faith, really yeah. beautiful. The mystery. Well, again, the, the pyramid is such an important shape. In art, it's always been important as a part of the composition, and especially in Renaissance art, it becomes such a focal point of, of um, creating perspective. And, and the idea that saints or uh, patron saints are, are always encased in this very magical, strong shape. Yes, and I think that shape appears in almost every culture as a very powerful 
Right, in one way or another, whether always. it's a Jewish, yeah, star, the Jewish star or, or yes. saints, so there's oh, yes. always this, this very beautiful formula involved. So is it what wanted to... It's a math, it's really yeah. amazing. Of course, it has our uh, homemade patron saint icons <laughs> that float around, referencing uh, Afro-Cuban Santeria right. and, and our, our religious customs. Yeah, there's one on there that looks like the saint of many hands. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you'll find more. <laughs> it's a Buddha. <laughs> And so on to our last intervention um, with the vulnerability. The theme of the room was about vulnerability. And yes, it's about uh, vulnerable women in art and the phenomenon that during a time where very powerful women were, were in, in power, um, uh, in art, somehow there was this need to portray women as very vulnerable, and and um, the idea that women almost stand in as a proxy for that humanity is vulnerable, not necessarily just women, but humanity is very vulnerable to the to the powers that be and to the and to the cycles of life. But Isabel used lace, always uses lace because it's a it looks so fragile, but it's yet one of the sturdiest and longest lasting textiles that you can imagine. It's a weave that really holds a lot of. Yeah, lot because of, of its flexibility, it's it doesn't tear easily, it doesn't break easily. It appears fragile, but it's so sturdy. And it holds your heat. You think it's cold, but it's not. I mean, that's why I did lace for Michelle because it actually made it made her warmer. Yeah, we think that, that fabrics with little holes in it would be would be cold, but in fact it traps more heat. The piece is called Three Forces and it's inspired by the themes but also by the goya. Oh yes. Very that much you so. You can see in the in the corner. Yeah, the incredible goya portrait um of There it is. Yeah, that that veiled that and the, the contrast of the black and white, which is very beautiful. Very true, which references Frida's mustache, the famous mustache, in, and in, mine and <laughs> Isabel's. So, so yeah, that that idea of, of fragility being veiled by lace is a very strong image. Isabel and Ruben Toledo's special exhibit, Labor of Love, will be on view at the Detroit Institute of Arts until July 4, 2019. Entrance to the exhibit and the DIA is free for residents of Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties. The DIA is open Tuesday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Fridays, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., Saturday and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The museum is closed on Mondays. Only you 
could fashion a few than that Come and visit one of America's great museums.